listen to Mr. Adeni over and over again. So many pertinent lessons uh, to take. You know, as, uh, as they both talked, the first two speakers, Dr. Molly and Mr. Adeni, just felt like they compared notes, you know, and they were basically telling us that the ball is uh, in our court. And then I remembered, you know, for those of us who are very used to watching reality TV uh, shows now, we Nigerian, both youth and uh, youthful, I would say, you know, it feels like, you know, sometimes when people in, in, a, in the house or in the community gang up and feel like they have a common enemy, right? And uh, work together to, to put the person out. And then when the person is finally out, everybody looks inside and realizes we're not friends after all, you know? because there's always that selfish interest. And I think that that's the, is the core message to take away that, you know, regardless of the structure of power, regardless of um, whatever it is, sharing of resources, at the end of the day, it's down to us, it boils down to us and our participation in making this country what we really want it uh, to be. Uh, for those of us who have been part of the conversation here, I'm sure you've taken so many lessons. Please join the conversation online as well. I'm very grateful to, uh, to you all for being here physically. But then please join the conversation online to also amplify the things that you're hearing. And you can do that using the hashtags, the platform NG. You can also do that using the, the hashtag, the platform Nigeria and the hashtag devolution of powers. I'll take that again. The platform NG, the platform Nigeria, and devolution of powers. We're live on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. We're also live on Mixlr. That's uh, www.mixlr.com forward slash uh, covenant. And then on YouTube, we're live on our YouTube channel. That's the platform NG. On Facebook, we're also live on the platform Nigeria. On Instagram, we're live at the platform Nigeria. And on Twitter, it is the platform um, NG. A couple of other things uh, to mention. Okay, so all, all of those uh, hashtags and addresses are on the screen so you can, you can follow. Uh, just before we bring up our, our next speaker, just to note that our next speaker is going to be um, live addressing us via multimedia. So please, for those of us who are uh, in front of the screen here, you just have to tilt your seats a little bit to, to, to watch him. And then for the rest of us, I'm sure we can use uh, the screens. You're welcome once again to the platform Nigeria. We are live at the Covenant Place, Igomu, Lagos State. I'm Ngozi Akinyele, and it's my joy to bring up our next speaker, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka. <laughs> bishop Kuka is the current bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Sokoto in Northwestern Nigeria. Bishop Kuka holds a Bachelor of Divinity from the St. Augustine's Seminary, a master's degree in peace studies at the University of Bradford, and a doctorate degree from the School of Oriental and African Studies. He was a senior Rhodes Fellow at the St. Anthony's University, Oxford, and a Mason Fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Gov Government, Harvard, and also earned another master's degree there in public policy. Back here in Nigeria, Bishop Kuka has served on various presidential initiatives, including the National Political Reform Conference, and was the presidential facilitator who negotiated an end to the hostilities between SPDC and the Ogoni people. He is the chairman of the Interreligious Dialogue Committees for both the Bishop's Conferences of Nigeria and West Africa, and is a member of the Pontifical Council of Interreligious Dialogue at the Vatican City. He is the founder of the Kuka Center, a think tank with a focus on faith and public policy in Abuja and Kaduna, Nigeria. Today, he's speaking to us on a topic, Nigeria, we need to exhale. Please join me as I welcome Bishop Matthew Kuka. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, I'm sure you'll have some difficulties. Uh, you have to adjust your screen to recognize me, but I'm speaking to you from Sokoto, from my balcony. Um, I am dressed slightly differently, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little story about the consequences of uh, priests dressing differently. Uh, there was a young priest who had a very good relationship with the family. And he always, they always met him in church wearing his uh, sutan, which is the long white uh, gown that we wear. And he was friends to a family, and they had a little five-year-old daughter who was uh, very fond of father. And one day it was the little girl who invited father to their house. You know, he said, why don't you come to our house for dinner? And father accepted the invitation. Uh, he turned up for dinner at about... 7 p.m., pressed the doorbell, and the little girl ran to the door, uh, so opened the door and saw father. But he wasn't wearing his sutan, he was wearing a kaftan instead. A nice looking kaftan, but the little girl quickly closed the door, ran back to her mother and said, Mom, mommy, come and see, father has become a man. Um, I'm sure many of you looking at me, I say, not in my sutan, I've become a man. What I'm wearing is, uh, today is May 1st, uh, Labor Day, but also in 1955, uh, the Catholic Church dedicated this day to workers in order to not take the shine away from the communists, but also to call attention that work is not just labor, but work is a gift from God. Uh, so, and, to, and this year also, for what it is worth, uh, Pope Francis has dedicated the whole of this year to honoring St. Joseph, and that is why I'm wearing this attire. So, so this, is, this attire is uh, what we, are, we have in honor of uh, St. Joseph, uh, the worker. Uh, so today we stand in solidarity with all the workers of Nigeria, and uh, we hope and pray that working together, uh, if the evolution really gets off ground, then uh, our workers will not only be happy, but their labors will not be in vain. Now, uh, Poju, unfortunately, uh, simply invited me. I didn't know about the, the, the general theme until I turned my television on and saw the screen. Uh, but he had already accepted my, my title. And I noticed also that the place is literally taken over by lawyers. I listened extensively to um or more or less extremely beautiful and well-crafted lecture indeed what he said and what uh, pastor poju said literally enough to ask us to go home um, and chew on some of those uh, issues that have been raised i also noticed that the vice president is going to be uh coming up to wrap up everything and for then of course the combination of him and Olisa bakoba all the senior advocates of Nigeria, it leaves us very little room for maneuver. However, um, I come from a slightly different perspective, and uh, I listen very carefully to my good friend Shego, uh, who also didn't uh, disappoint. But I, my idea is that I think Nigeria needs to exhale, uh, in part because of what we have and the threat it poses to our lungs. I'm not a medical doctor, but it seems to me that the toxicity around our environment suggests very, very clearly that we have inhaled a lot of terrible things. Most of what we are witnessing in Nigeria today, where we are, where we now find ourselves, the dark clouds are coming faster than we ever thought. Uh, my governor has raised alarm, saying that... Um, these people are coming right into our, our, our cities and so on. I therefore say we need to exhale because even the theme about devolution of power uh, shouldn't take away individual responsibility um, and individual duties. Because at the end of the day, we are still largely involved in a conversation in which Nigerians see themselves as objects. So we believe that the dividends of democracy are going to be realized when we have people who are able to do good things to us. Uh, the reality, of course, is that politics is much more complicated than that. 
And because we are outsourcing our responsibilities and busy looking for good people who will govern us, we miss the very fundamental fact that it is the, an aggregate of the little, little things that each and every one of us does that makes for democracy, that makes for a good society. As I said, I decided to title my presentation Waiting to Exhale, because I think we need to exhale. And it's, of course, as you know very well from the novel written in 1995 by Terry Macmillan, which finally uh, became a movie. And I, I believe that many women who are in their 30s and 40s and 50s will probably recognize themselves in, in, the, in the four women uh, that are in the cast uh, of that story. But of course, uh, the woman, I mean, the, the conclusion is that there is need to exhale because my favorite line, and I like the theme song, it says, for every wind, someone must fall. There comes a time when we must exhale. And I think now is the time for Nigeria to exhale. Because if you push back, and please permit me, because we have a government in place. A lot of the things we say must also be based on what we can see on the scoreboard. Um, people, a lot of people think that when we say the things we say, it is about APC as a government, or it's about Buhari as a president. But of course, the truth of the matter is that this engagement is, is, is important. Because when we, in 2015, and it's also interesting that a lot of videos have now come out. A lot of videos are now being are now coming out, and this is why it is important to exhale. Um, and we are seeing and we're being reminded of the promises, of the commitments that were made in 2015, the run-up to the election. And therefore, our duty, our responsibility as ordinary citizens will be to continue to hold before our politicians the promises that we didn't make, but we did themselves made. Now, I, I was watching one of these videos uh, three days ago, and it has the president and is listing all the things that the president himself said. None of these things were put in his mouth, that Nigeria will be governed honestly and there will be a constitutional government. I think we are still on that road and that Nigeria will be turned into an internationally respected country. And that the preservation of the nation's future was going to be the guiding principle of government. And that this government will attack poverty and walk through shared economic growth. And that power, the power holding company, and I like the way the president made a joke. I mean, the, he, was, he was presidential candidate then that power holding company will not only have the power to hold us in darkness and that our 250 daughters are still out there and as at that time the government of the day had done nothing and of course the president also was campaigning at a time when some of our citizens had died in the, in the national stadium and he made it very clear he said it was unacceptable that several people will be trampled to death in our country and of course, he makes the final commitment and he will run an equal government in which all of us will be as a family. And that finally, it will be a compassionate government full of compassion. And this compassion will arise from our trust in our management, the management of our commonwealth. And finally, it will be on record at the end of it all that President Buhari has given his all for all this nation. Now, I make this point not because of anything, but because I think it's important for us to, 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 to think that memory is very important. Because politicians make promises and they will continue to make promises. And a lot of the videos that are coming out also are even telling us things that we have all, all of us almost collectively forgot. But what is also very interesting and quite significant, and it's important for us because I think, you know, the way we cannot improve on, on how... Uh, Omole put all this very clearly in perspective. When he said, in the final analysis, it is not the change you know, of, of, of structures. If you're going to have the same actors, 
I mean, he could also have used Nigeria, you know, in talking about, about the Soviet Union, you know, at, at the end of it all. Because every country in transition that goes through the process of, 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 of um, what is the word? Um, you know, deciding to dispose of its assets. When governments decide to do this, what normally happens is that these are also very, very corrupt initiatives because institutions, the commonwealth of, of, of the nation, the prices are brought down. These things are given to political friends. And at the end of the day, I'm sure it also accounts for the fact that up till today, the promises that were made to us, whether it is in the area of power generation and so on and so forth, these promises have not been able to work out. So in a way, it's important, I think, even for us as a country, and I'm sure for a lot of my friends in the All Progressive Congress, to ask themselves, you know, if we go back to the blackboard, can we recognize ourselves in the promises that we made? When we took off in, on May 29th, 2015, from then till now, where are we? And this interrogation is necessary because it will help us identify the mistakes that we have made, uh, because these interrogations are necessary, but they're not, they're, they're not done in bad faith. They are important because if we do not identify the mistakes, and if we don't see the gaps between promises and action, then the trust deficit will continue. Then ordinary people will continue to be mesmerized, carried away by promises that politicians are making with no intentions of keeping. It is not the responsibility of the politician you know, to remind you of the promise he made. It is your responsibility and your obligation to hold that promise before him because those also actually ought to be the issues guiding elections. So when a politician comes back to you asking you for his vote, what you should be saying is keep your mouth shut. Can you look at this? Where are all the promises you made? One, two, three, four, five. Where are we with them? But of course, a lot of those things also suggest a fairly steady political platform on which political actions are taking place. That also means that the, 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 the electoral institutions are not compromised and that when we're running politics on the kind of environment in which whoever is president determines who is the inspector general of police, who is the chief, the army chief, and he can literally gather all the institutions of state and deploy them to achieve you know, a particular outcome. This is characteristics of politics across Africa. It's not peculiar to us in Nigeria, but it makes the point, and I think the point has also been very well been, been properly underscored, that even if you talk about devolving power, the critical thing is, are you devolving responsibility? From what we can see with our local government chairmen, with the governors, with those into whose hands our trust, our responsibilities have been placed, we can see that, as my friend Aldo said once to me, he said, Politicians in Nigeria think that we vote them to enjoy on our behalf. Now, citizens therefore must have the capacity to, to, you know, to interrogate. There is something, and then of course, you know, like they tell you in a plane, take off and gaining altitude. Taking off is one of the most dangerous times, and landing is also one of the most difficult times in a flight. Now, some of you do remember an incident that happened on the 18th, uh, of September 1961, uh, in what is now Democratic Republic of, uh, of Congo, when Doug Hammarskjöld, the 51-year-old uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, was uh, was on a on a flight, that flight crashed, and all the 16 people in the plane all perished. It is very interesting that from 1961 up till today, in fact, in trade. You know, about 11 or so initiatives have been taken to unravel what really happened. And as of 2019, the current Secretary General of the United Nations has also okayed the fact that further investigations should continue. That is, for such an international civil servant of prominence, and that with the involvement of the international community up till today, the mystery around that accident has not been unraveled. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because one of the very interesting things that happened in that flight is that when the flight took off, the flight was supposed to land at Ndola, Ndolo Airport. And Ndolo Airport is one of the biggest, or was then the second largest airport in Zaire, as it was then. 
But the plane ended up crashing in Ndola. And Ndola is in present day Zambia. The question is, how is it that a plane that set out to go and land in Ndolo, in Democratic Republic of, of Congo, where the Hamas and the team were going to have a meeting, you know, with, with President Shombe. Now, the interesting thing is that, and you will note, that the only thing that changed the conversation was the letter A. Ndolo ends with an O, and Ndola, where the airport, I mean, you know, where the plane finally crashed, is a thick forest. But what is also interesting, and the question to ask, and I think for, you know, for the purpose of, of the conversation we're having, is who changed the letter O to the letter A? I make the point because it's just to underscore the fact that those of us who are Nigerians and who listen to all the promises and who listen to all the things and have the vision about what this country might look like, did we foresee Boko Haram? Did we foresee banditry? Did we foresee the situation we now find ourselves in? Or as somebody would say, who moved the cheese? Now, clearly, where our country and like where our country is now requires sobriety. It's not so much a question of trading blames, but at the same time, we must also remember it is not enough for us to simply paddle on and say that the solution to our problem is mere prayer. You know, when people say to me that one of, I met a friend of mine, very good friend of mine, who is one of our governors, and I was having a conversation with him, and he said to me, he said, Bishop Kuka, why are you always causing trouble? And I laughed because, and I said to him, I said, well, you know, we, I, I can't cause trouble. I can't cause what is not there. We are already in trouble. It's a question of how do we get out of the trouble? And we elected you to fix our problems. If the, if the problem still, for, still persists, you are the one generating the trouble, not myself. But the point I'm making is we must answer these questions because it, they also raise our questions. Namely, when politicians come together to form a party, when the politicians take certain decisions, when politicians have won election, how is power distributed? How is responsibility distributed? Because from what we now see and what we're now experiencing, this is not a country that anybody, even the least member of APC, not to talk about the highest level, can imagine that they foresaw. This is not where we are now. It's not where even the greatest enemy of the APC or the greatest enemy of Nigeria could have foreseen. So we have found ourselves in this hard place. I'm asking myself, did we land at this dollar by accident, or did somebody change something somewhere? It's important that we ask these questions because these tendencies will always follow us wherever we go. So whether you devolve power at a local government, whether you devolve power at a, at a, at a at, at any level at all, if citizens don't become sufficiently alert, if citizens don't continue to engage the political class, you know, the problem in Nigeria, and a lot of it is largely cultural, you know, we have certain cultural attitudes that are an antithesis to democracy. For example, it is very interesting that people say that one of the greatest threats to democracy is gerontocracy. And gerontocracy is a government, the participation of old people in government. Political science 101 makes the case. I'm not the one making the case. So the challenge, and I think Shegun makes the point, and it's not, enough, it's not about substituting the youth for the old, no. It is that we have certain cultural tendencies that are in themselves contrary to the principles of democracy. So for example, yes, of course, everybody respects old age, but be old because the problem is that if you had if you if you listen if you watch president obasa just body language and, and him and uh, and gali naaba for example and i imagine that president obasa as an old yoruba man will of course naturally know that gali naaba who probably would have been just one of his children cannot stand in front of him to ask him questions and this is as he as a yoruba man but Gali Naba says, no, I'm speaker of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I can ask you questions, and I can actually impeach you. Now, these conversations 
sit side by side with what we are trying to do as you know as democracy so politicians think that if you are asking questions you know you must be trying to cause trouble i've had my own fair share of trouble i am not happy about where we are now but i'm also happy and i feel vindicated that i raised some of these issues more than five years ago but every time you raise the issues either people tell you you don't like a religion you don't like a particular people you don't like a party or as they say to me ah you know jonathan was your friend that is why you are saying the things you are saying but we are where we are now now there is a very interesting book that was written by a man called michael moore there's a very interesting book written by an american author an activist called michael more. I don't know what's happening. Start my video. Where is it now? All right. Sorry, you have to bear with me. Uh, you know, you people, Poju, you people in Lagos have refused. Uh, Lisa Abakoba, you people in Lagos have refused to devolve power to Sokoto and other places. If you devolve power, we'll be a bit more efficient here. Now, in in uh, during the time of uh, of Bush. A man called Michael Moore published, an American intellectual, very serious thinker, a member of the Democratic Party, but also an, a rabid you know, activist. He published a book titled, Dude, Where is My Country? And I feel like asking almost like President Buhari and the APC, where is our country? Now, we need to have a conversation. A lot of people are saying we need to talk. And a lot of these sentiments are also focusing largely on the hardware of the issue, namely, or less we have we need to fund the military we need to pay more money this is all good and fine but there is something that is still not happening and it is that most of us must understand that a lot of the benefits of democracy are not necessarily tangible a lot of the benefits of democracy are largely intangible not even recognizable they are largely things that you just feel a particular kind of feeling so when governors talk about come and see how well we are doing because we are building bridges and we are building roads and we are supplying water and we are so on and so on when the focus is on contracts and contractocracy we miss the fine ingredients of democracy which is that essentially every country must come to terms with the fact that to claim the loyalty of your citizens is perhaps the most important tool for legitimation because if your people don't trust you if your people's loyalty is elsewhere which is where we are now in Nigeria. So the question is, even if we put ideas on the what are we really talking about? The challenge now is how do we get our how do we get our groove back? Let me put it that way. How do we connect back? Because all the things we are hearing now, nobody would have expected that we'll you know will come to this point in which everybody wants to go home. And of course, people have said severally that whatever it is, like I think my Yes, it may be right for everybody to want to go. Yes, it may be right for people to feel so dissatisfied that they want an end to what we have today. But the cost of staying together is far cheaper than the cost of everybody going his way. But again, the most important thing here is that the government must give us a reason. And a lot of these things are not necessarily the, you know, they are, they are, they are the things, it's largely what you may call body language. We need to be inspired as a, as a country to convince ourselves that this country is worth the emotional and the psychological and the spiritual and the cultural involved, you know, uh, engagement. Now, our country is unraveling. There have been many excuses. A lot of books have been written then as now pointing out the difficulties that lay ahead for Nigeria. Peter Eke, God bless and rest his soul, raised the issue in his famous essay of the two uh, publics about the need for government to come to terms with the fact that the loyalty of ordinary citizens is largely based on their localities. And of course, the most important thing for government is, of course, primarily to move people's loyalty from different disparate groups to the center. John Payden warned us about the dangers of having a democracy without a political culture. Professor James O'Connell of blessed memory, the one who, who he taught in Amadou Bele University, 
And the new Nigerian once wrote an editorial about him in which it said that the amount of political science Professor O'Connell didn't know could not fill the back of his stamp. He was my teacher. But he wrote about what he called the inevitability of instability. That is that in a democracy or any form of government, instability is inevitable. The challenge is to design the tools for managing instability. And of course, instability can be induced by ethnicity, it can be induced by social inequalities, it can be induced by political differences, it can be induced by the inability or unwillingness of government to share the benefits of power adequately. And I think here, I really don't want to go into the details, but I think anybody who loves this country will have to accept the fact that the APC as a government and the president must take responsibility for the fact that the way power has been distributed in Nigeria has created a sense of alienation. And it is the underlining factor for why people feel the way they feel, why people feel so disenchanted, why people don't feel a sense of emotional or psychological or cultural or even economic involvement in their country. And there is need to reclaim this whole thing back because clearly, I mean, I go back to a story that all of us know. And it's an important story to go to. That is because when, when, when my brothers in the North were grumbling, they weren't grumbling loudly. When Patricia Ete was the speaker, the argument was, how can you have a president who is a, 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 a Christian and a Senate president who is a Christian? And then we now have a speaker you know, who is a Christian. This is unacceptable. But the politicians were clever. Instead of confronting this head on, they decided to fall back on accus spurious accusations of corruption against Patricia Ete. The rest of the story is pretty well known. But it's also quite significant that at the end of the day, the National I mean, the, the, the House of Representatives, had, on the final sitting of the Sixth Assembly, the House of Representatives made the point that they found no case in their records of indictment against Patricia Ete. This is out, after she had been forced to resign. But she was forced to resign and the fact of the matter, and it starts to be disputed, but the reality was Northern Nigeria needed to see a face that will inspire confidence of Northerners into the system. Nothing wrong with that. Bankole came back, eloquent gentleman, very well educated, more than qualified for his job. But of course, we know that perhaps the decision to bring Bankole was one, he was a Muslim, and two, he was male. Now, when you fast forward, and you see where we have ended up from 2015 today, that we have a National Assembly, it definitely cannot be an accident that we ended up with the National Assembly that we have today. It cannot be an accident that somehow people just got into the House and decided to elect, you know, an almost all Muslim leadership at the highest level of the House. It, cannot, it couldn't be an accident. Now, these are the things that nip away and chip away at the moral armor of power. When people don't feel, or when people feel, you know, shortchanged by the way power has been allocated, then they, people feel alienated. And when they feel alienated, what can you do? You cannot sing outside the choir. You know, so it's important to make these points. Bala Usman warned us several years ago about the consequences, the negative consequences of the manipulation of religion. Chino Achebe raised the issue about the need for us to very quickly get around the whole question of the quality of leadership that we have in our country. Now, this is a country that doesn't like to debate, but the Nobel Prize winner, Amartya Sen, you know, Amartya Sen has a little book titled The Argumentative India, and he makes the point. Of course, he's attacking British, the, you know, British democracy, but also for the British, thinking that they can claim they brought democracy to India. And he says, look, arguments, debates, we are always part and parcel of the social fabric, you know, of Indian life. And I think we can say the same thing about the village square. So. I make the point because a government that is hostile to, to, to public opinion, negative or positive, runs the risk of only listening to its own voice. Now, my good friend, Professor George Obioso, uh, addressed Ohanez Ndibo the other day. And uh, by the way, I always joke with him. He wrote a little book titled uh, Diplomacy of Precarious Balancing. And when he was elected, I congratulated him and hoped that uh, he will, now that uh, Ohanez Ndibo is where it is, he can bring his skills, you know, to bear. But he argued in a video clip that I saw, which was saying, look, you cannot tell the Igbo people that they should always be speaking with one voice. The reason is because we are gifted. People are very educated. You know, everybody is skilled. People are economically, you know, 
pretty well to do. So we cannot be speaking with one voice. But I say to him, I say, sir, I beg to slightly disagree with you. You know, everybody who, who participates in an orchestra, everybody is pretty well versed in the instrument they are using. But an orchestra is an orchestra because a conductor has the capacity to harmonize all the various you know, instruments. So it is important because I'm robust like-minded people. Those in the National Assembly who pack budgets, they are like-minded people. Those who in the bureaucracy ignore procurement procedure, they are all like-minded people. Boko Haram is made up of like-minded people. The bandits are like-minded. Kidnappers are like-minded. All criminals are like-minded. So when we talk of like-mindedness, and we've not defined what the issues are, we cannot simply assume that the measure of your patriotism is how much you support the president or you support the party in power. This country is far more than any political party or any president, because president will come, president will go. Our country remains. So I make the point, therefore, that government must understand that all of us have a responsibility, especially those of us who are educated. We have a responsibility to make our own contribution. But that contribution must be treated with the respect it deserves. And citizens must not be made to feel inadequate. They must not be made to feel afraid for speaking out their right. Of course, if you go beyond the boundaries of the law, the law should take its course. But we must not end up with a, with, with a country in which citizens are simply lying prostrate because they are afraid. And of course, some, sometimes in many of these issues, the real enemies are those who pretend in front of government when the reality, what they feel is completely different. The real enemies are those who are simply keeping their powder dry. Because if something happens today, they can fall either way. And say, well, I, did you hear me? You know, did you hear me raising any issue against you? And you don't know where they stand. But at the moment, where we are now requires that all of us have an idea about where we stand. Because our future, we have a responsibility. And Nigerians need to breathe. But the question we need to now address is, what do we need collectively to? Of course, all of us are angry. But in my view, this is not a time for anger. The challenge, of course, therefore, is what kind of palliatives do we need you know, to calm our nerves? And I'm not talking here of, well, the, the, the palliatives in the way and manner that we understand them. But something needs to happen to send out a signal to Nigerians that something is happening and that things are under control. Now, of course, we, we, we I don't know what to say. I, I'm not sure whether to comment, but I think that the, 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 the fact that we had the Secretary of State for Africa uh, coming to, I mean, speaking to us virtually, I would have preferred that the, our president spoke to the president of America rather than the secretary, I mean, the secretary of state. And anyway, half bread is better than not, you know, than nothing. But at least I want to assume that this is a sign that we are going somewhere. But the need to quickly get our people together, the need to quickly rally our people together, both to support government and other powers is very urgent. And we cannot do this if we continue to think that our country is divided between those who love the party in power and those who don't love the party in power. We're in a democracy. And we want to believe that this democracy has to be nurtured. And the best we can do is not to subvert the process, but to continue to hold certain ideals and goals before those who are in power. Now, let me try and end by raising a very fundamental question. The... What Washington-based scholar, um, Francis Fukuyama, has published uh, a little book, which I just finished reading, and it's about identity. And he raises some very, very important questions, because he talks about how important people feel about their identity. He talks about a concept of what he calls timos, and timos is an inherent principle in all of us as human beings. To be, this, to, be, to be recognized. All of us want to be recognized in whatever shape or form. And when people feel that they've not been recognized, there will be consequences for the system. I had a joke about um, uh, a church in America. You know, one day they decided to sing, start their, their, their service with a song. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. You know, and a man who was a cripple, uh, the next day, on Monday, he decided to file a case against the pastor. But he said he was disabled 
and that it wasn't, you know, there was no way that the church could be singing stand up, stand up for Jesus without paying attention to him, you know, on his wheelchair, and that he couldn't stand up, and therefore he felt discriminated against. But the whole sense of recognition, everybody wants to be recognized. Now, that recognition is inherent. You may call it human rights, but human rights are what they are. Human rights are not aspirations. If I say I want to buy a, a, a plane, you know, it's an aspiration, it's not a human right. But I, I'm entitled to dignity. And once I perceive that that dignity is assaulted by virtue of my religion, by virtue of my social status, by virtue of, of, of my social class, by virtue of my gender, people will resist. And it has nothing to do with how much power they have you know, uh, in their hands. The second notion is what Fukuyama refers to as isotemia. Isotemia is the demand by all of us for respect from others. You step on my foot, I say, Oga, you are, stand, you are stepping on my foot. My response will determine, I mean, your response will determine how I react. If you turn around and say to me, get out of my way, my friend, who are you? Why did you put your leg here? Ah, it doesn't matter how tall you are. I will contemplate revenge. But if you turn around and say, oh, I'm so sorry, then we can have a relationship. So the demand for respect and equality, it's a basic demand. We are not, when people talk about equality, we are not saying, nobody, no group starts a race and finishes at the same time. But everybody, a, a society must create an environment in which everyone can excel according to their capacity and their capability. I often say to people, if you fill a bottle with water and you fill a drum with water, which one is more full? None is fuller than the other. All of them are full according to their capacity. So a society, a government must be conscious. And this is why the struggle by people with disability, the struggle by people, by all categories of people in Nigeria must be taken seriously. And of course, I commend the federal government for putting at least institutional responses. The question, of course, is the challenges of bureaucratic efficiency and the ability to deliver on services and so on. And then Fukuyama made a final point of what you call megalothemia. And megalothemia is more dangerous because it is the wish, the quest by an individual to be recognized as being superior. So megalothemia is the quest by men to insist that women recognize that they are superior. The quest by people, the rich, to insist that the poor people recognize that they are superior. The quest by people on the basis of religion to claim that they are superior to others by virtue of their religion. These claims have consequences. Finally, the next, the response to it is that a government must develop a sense of empathy. And I have said it severally. And I do not mean anything negative. I have said it several, and I saw everywhere you turn this is what Nigerians are saying, that people are dying. And we don't get a sense that those who govern us understand and flower pain. Because we have not seen them at our funerals. We have not seen them on condolence visits. We've not seen them uh, whether by telephone call or whatever. Empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is at the heart of who we are as human beings. That is, it is what makes you go to greet somebody who is dying and you put your hand over his shoulder and tell them they will be okay. Empathy is the feeling of the sorrow, the pain of the other person. Indeed, entering the skin of another person. It does not bring healing immediately. But there's a certain kind of psychological comfort that it gives. A woman who has just lost her husband, for example, you go to her, you tell her it will be okay. She will not, but she knows that it is not okay. But at least if you tell her as a priest, it is okay, she knows that somebody cares. And the point I'm making is on the issue of Nigerians dying, Government has come up very, very short. And this is what is increasing the pain, the agony, the sorrow of people. That we are dying alone, burying our people alone, and all we get are just simple statements that really say nothing to us. Now, I want to end by saying the lack of empathy and the deployment of empathy has consequences. And I'll use two, two examples. The first example is an incident that happened in, Tun in the city of Tunis on the 17th of December 2010. When, as many of you already know the story, 
a young man called Mohamed Bozuzi, a fruit vendor in Tunis. And the story is known to, you know, to most of us. But he was hawking his fruit. Then he was arrested by a government official. And they asked for his permit. He didn't have his permit. Okay. As if that was not bad enough, his equipment was confiscated. And he was spat upon. The government official spat on his face. And after spitting on his face, the government official followed with a slap. To make matters worse, and with no disrespect intended, this government official was a woman. Haba, it is okay to be slapped by a policeman. It is okay for me to be slapped by a man who is seven feet tall. I can understand and pretend I've forgiven him because I know there's not much I can do. But to be slapped by a woman in public, Bozuzi didn't fight her. He didn't fight her. But at that point, a combination of Timos and Isotimia were at play. Despite hawking his fruits, this man wanted to be respected because he wasn't a thief. But he also demanded equal respect from a government official. He didn't get that. Then he decided to go to, to see the governor in anger and frustration. One, so he would get back his, his, his cut, and two, either demand an apology or whatever. Guess what? The governor refused to see him. And it was as a result of that com com combination of humiliation. Not only has his means of livelihood been taken away from him, are you ever going to go back home and to say to your wife, eh, one woman slap me for, 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 for street. Your wife say, where is your cat? Eh, one woman take him, he slap me for, for. Haba, where will you see food that night? Because the, your wife will tell you, go and join the, the, the women's section. But when this man does not get Timos and doesn't get Isotimia, he doesn't get a combination of all that make him who he is. And he goes to seek for, it, for, for redress and doesn't get the redress. Then he decides, what am I living for? He decided to put him on fire. The rest is history. But that is what started the Arab Spring. The second incident happened in Benin City, the capital of Edo State. My good friend Adam Soshimole, Komre Roshimole, the governor, and he embarked on urban renewal. A street was being construct, you know, constructed. Those of you who are familiar with Benin, no mission rule. And you know, like the good governor he was trying to give, he was, he decided to go and inspect the, you know, you know, the road. And he missed this woman, again, almost a fruit seller, sitting by the side of the road. And comrade, comrade governor says to her, Joy, I mean, of course, he doesn't know her name is Joy, but he said, Madam, please move. And the woman apparently was a bit resistant. But finally, we know the rest of the story. This woman, I think, uh, the governor tried to say to her, look, if you know, we do something can happen to you and you can die. But all we remember from the media was that the governor is quoted to have said no like that to go and die. Now, the media took up the story, which was a good thing. But guess compare the reaction of Adam Soshimole, the governor, with the reaction of the people in Tunis. Because Adams now invites this woman, he places a face on her. Her name is Joy Efeji. The world now knows. She enters government house, she has tea with the governor. The governor gives her two million naira and offers her a job. The life changes completely. Now, what does all this you know, come to? It comes to two very critical things. The first, please excuse me, my battery is running low. Let me, <laughs> sorry. It comes to two very critical things. The first is that, among, among other things, that how government responds uh, to, 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 to victims, of uh, the, ex the exercise of the state is very important. Now, because of the way Adam Soshimole responded to this woman, we saw things change completely. We have also had other incidents. And I'm making this point to underscore the fact that even being victims of Boko Haram, being victims of the crisis we are in now, could also have positive uh, impact because we don't know God's plans. For goodness sake, how could anybody have known had Albert Einstein not fled, you know, to America, where would we have, where would the world be today? Had Arnold Schwarzenegger not fled to America, his story would have been different. Brennan Henry, 
I mean, I mean, Sergey Brenin, the co-founder of Google, fled from Russia. Henry Kissinger, Medin Albright. So we have stories of people who have turned misfortune or misfortune has turned them into something completely different. Mo Farah is a British citizen today. What would his life have been like? You know, had he fled from Somalia? From Somalia, we know the story of Mamadou Gassama, a young man, an immigrant, literally fleeing, who suddenly sees this this baby dangling from a window. He goes to help the baby. He doesn't have papers. He's running away from the police. But that single incident changes his life. The next thing is sitting face to face with the, with, you know, with the uh, prime minister of France, John Oga, our own son. I believe he must be from Cross River. But John Oga manages to find himself in Rome. He's standing there looking for somebody to give him something to eat. He sees a thief, manages to single-handedly arrest the thief. The next thing is giving Italian citizenship and ends up, guess what, being baptized by the Pope. The point I'm making is, you know, we don't know what God's plans are for anybody. People may be suffering displacement. They may be wherever they find themselves today. But it, is, it behoves on us to, in a way, I think this is the greatest devolution that we can set our devolution even before government devolves. Our communities are tearing apart. Families are tearing apart. It is important that religious leaders, community leaders, are sufficiently supported to be able to bring meaning to the lives of ordinary people. Now, I listened to BBC yesterday, Hausa Service, and I listened to the story of this, 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 this young man uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in some part of Niger. What is his story? He said that on behalf of his community, his community, about maybe one of the 40 communities overrun by, 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 by the bandits, he said they've now had to make a pact with the, with, with the leaders of these bandits. And the leaders of the bandits have told them, give us this number of motorcycles, give us this amount of money, and we'll let you go to your farms. Now, they have done that. And I, the journalist, a very good journalist for that matter, the journalist says, how are you sure these people are going to keep their promise? And the gentleman answered most eloquently, what choice do we have? What choice do we have? We don't have a choice. We have written to government, no reply. We have cried, no, nobody has come to us. We now have to, the, the, the raped victim has to make peace with the rapist. So this is where we are. And this is why I, my own feeling is that I think we need to think a bit more clearly and come to terms with the fact that right now, all of us have a duty and a responsibility. This house will not fall and it must not fall. But the duty of holding it together, it behoves some government to send out practical messages about different constituencies in this country, what can everybody do? Because if the president of Nigeria does not give us a sense of direction about where the government wants us to contribute, what we are left with is a case of a man going to cry more than they believe. Because very often, I mean, of course, there are a lot of things we can do on our own, but it seems that government must develop better listening devices, better equipment for communicating with the citizens of Nigeria Building our country, rebuilding our future is the least we owe our, the generation that is coming be, you know, before us. We have consumed their future. It is an unforgivable sin and a crime. My hope is that all of us can collectively do our best to ensure that we live a country where citizens can live in fear, you know, live without fear because of their social status, because of their religious views, because of who they are, or simply because they are minority. I want to thank you, Poju, for, for, for putting this together. I really and truly commend you and I praise you. And um, I ask God to bless you and bless our dear country, Nigeria. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Uh, Sokoto is pretty hot. Eh? Sokoto is very hot. Thank you so much, Bishop. Another round of applause for him, please. Thank you so much.